Look with me now in Romans chapter 6, and um, this is our last time, our third and last time in verses 1 through 14 of Romans chapter 6. Uh, <clears throat> I forgot my glasses. Okay, let's see if this bigger print Bible works. All right, let's take a look. I think I can get it. Um, look at verse 1. This is the Word of God, infallible, inerrant, and eternal. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, or God forbid. How can we who died, now look at this phrase, underline it, how can we who died to sin still live in it that is sin? Look at this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Here it is again. We know that our old self was crucified with Him. Why? In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. Here's that word again. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you do its passions, obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under law, but under grace. The grass withers, the flower fades, the Word of our God abides forever. By His grace and mercy, may this His Word be preached for you. Please be seated. Well, just a, a couple of thoughts to get started, and I'm going to jump right in so that we can jump out in a timely manner, but so much is here. Folks, I'm going to ask you something up front. I'm going to ask you, even while I'm doing this, to, do, uh, to be ambidextrous. I want you to listen carefully, please, but I also want you to pray. I want you to pray for me, and I want to pray for yourself. This is the last time that I am scheduling myself to be in this text in our study of the book of Romans and the expositions, this, this, this passage of Romans 6, 1 through 14. It's not just any text. I'm reminded of the words that I shared with you of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He wouldn't even begin his series on Romans until he said he felt he had some grasp of Romans 6, 1 through 14. He says, this is foundational. It is foundational to understanding the book of Romans, and I believe he's right. And by the way, he's not the only commentator that says that, but he's a noteworthy one, perhaps one of the greatest expositors of God's Word from the previous century, in the 20th century. And, it, I, and so it captures my attention. It also captures my attention that he preached, and by the way, someone corrected me, and rightly so. Uh, he did not preach these sermons on Sunday night. He preached them on Friday night. And just think, that place was packed every Friday night, the Westminster Chapel. Friday night, the Westminster Chapel. 
me say it again, Friday night, the Westminster Chapel for one hour sermons. It was amazing. We get this wonderful multi uh, facet, this multi volume text. He died while preaching in Romans. Uh, and um, what a way to go. <laughs> and uh, he died while preaching in Romans. And, he, uh, uh, and it's just a glorious text. Four months of that time, of those years, he spent in Romans, four months of it, he spent just in the verses that we've taken three weeks to look at. This essential and foundational text. But I want your prayers to even go beyond that because in this text this morning, we see something that, that Paul has not done. We've been in this text, now this is our 40th sermon. We are in this text studying it, and this is the first time he's done this in our study of the first five chapters of the book of Romans down to chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, where we find ourselves this morning's focus. Paul is also, this is a text that's so important because Paul is not only presenting the gospel, he is presenting the gospel life, and he is presenting how we defend the gospel. What a glorious text. It is a text in which Paul is showing us that what he wrote Here's a text that we're about to see what he wrote about the Scripture he tried to mirror in his preaching and teaching. What did he write about the Scripture? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture, every Scripture is God-breathed, is inspired by God, and is what? Profitable. What is it profitable for? And all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for Doctrine, you can't do till you know. First, doctrine. And is profitable for doctrine, now application. Here's how he says it. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction. Reproof is negative, correction is positive. Why? Discipleship training the man of God for every good work. How do you have Christians in maturation? By the Word, the whole counsel of God, because everything is inspired and profitable, that is taught and preached and then applied. Now we get to application. Five chapters of gospel exposition, and now Paul is saying, can I put it this way? It's time for a life takeaway. Now is time for application. So, as I get to this application and anticipation of our life takeaway, matching up with what Paul is bringing us here, could I get you to do something else? Please do not feel silly. Please do not feel like a child. Please do not feel, Harry, I didn't go to the children's worship center, but I want you to do what someone did to me years ago when I was a young Christian and it has never left me. And one of the reasons it never left me was the way he introduced it to me. So I'm going to ask you to do something for me. And I'm going to ask you to do this. Please just kind of sit back and just say, it's okay. I can do this. I want you to repeat three words for me. You've heard me say them before, but I want you to repeat these three words. I want my best today to try to um, set the nail, three nails in succession. Say this word with me. No. You ready? No. This time, all of you. If I don't see you talk, it's time for church discipline. You ready? <laughs> say no. No. Now say the next word, be. Ready? Be. Now say the next word, do. Ready? Do. Say it all together. Ready? No. Be. Do. Please. Never forget that as the profile and the portrait of not only the Christian life, but how you live the Christian life, 
How can I live a Christian life with continual bubbling up of joy, even in the days of a fallen world and the, inc and the incessant dealing with the old man within me? How can, I how can I do the Christian life? How can I live this life with the underpinnings of joy, with directives that are effective, and knowing what I should do, how I should do it, why I should do it, how can a joyful obedience and the challenge of the spiritual warfare, how can that continue in my life? How can I, knowing my inadequacies, still walk in confidence? How can I, knowing the unending battles outside of me and inside of me, how can I continue to do that? I'm saying to you today, it's Paul's pattern, know, be, do. And I'll get to it at the end. This is merely anticipating it, and here he displays it for you as clearly as possible. Now, what's the context? Uh, what's the context that he, uh, whereby this chapter arrives? Well, Paul has given us an exposition of the gospel with the bad news that we're helpless, we're hopeless, we're unwilling to come to salvation, we're unable to come to salvation, but God, where there was no way, has made a way, his son Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and he has not only sent his son, but his risen, ascended son, has sent the Holy Spirit so that Christ did the work to save you, and now He sent the Holy Spirit to do the saving work upon you so that you can work out what Jesus worked for you and what the Holy Spirit is working in you. And so He then realizes that this glorious gospel truth, whenever preached, has two possible primary errors that attack it from Satan and the world. And those two primary errors, are errors, uh, gospel heresies are this. Number one is legalism, or what we call nomianism. And that nomos, nomos means law. Nomianism, or legalism. And that's the notion that God saves us, but God can't save us unless we, quote, and here it comes, do our part. Can I tell you what our part is? The problem not the solution. Well, what about when I do good things? Well, praise God. That's either common grace or redeeming grace. You didn't do it. God did it in you, and you did it working out what He worked in. And no matter what you do, it'll always be polluted by sin. We have a, we are born as sinners with a sin nature. We are dead in our sins. Now, we're not, as, we're not as depraved as we could be because God's common grace restrains us. But everyone that's born in this world, united to Adam, is born dead in their sins, unable, unwilling, and we're not only sinfully indicted under the court of God, we are spiritually unable to do anything about it. Therefore, we can't work our way to heaven. We don't bring works that allow God to save us. You see, legalism is the notion that man or woman, our obedience to God's law is, listen to me carefully, obedience to God's law is necessary for our salvation. It is either, it either, some of you say we have to obey the law to be saved. Some say we have to obey the law to allow God to save us. Some say we have to obey the law to enable God to save us. Legalism says we have to obey the law to be saved, to allow God to save us, to enable God to save us, and to enable God to keep us saved. We must obey the law. It's necessary. That's pure legalism. Our works are never in the foundation of our salvation. They are in the superstructure as the evidence of salvation. That's why we had that confession of truth this morning. For by grace, not works, not, not our works. Let me say that. Let me make that clear. I am saved by works. It's just not mine. It's Jesus' work, and then the Holy Spirit's work on me. But there, how do I get Jesus' work for me and the Holy Spirit upon me? It's unmerited. 
It is God's grace. For by grace are you saved. What's the instrument? Through faith. And that is not of your own doing. That is not of you. Even the faith was a gift to you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Not of works. Can you say it any clearer? Now, what about Jesus? Well, he's working on us, for we are his workmanship. It means the word, it's a literary word, workmanship. It mean, poema, it means the word masterpiece. We are masterpieces of God's grace written with the ink of God's Son's blood to save us. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, in union with Christ. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. Notice our works are the evidence of his work, not added to his work. It is his work that is evidence. We're not saved because of our works. We're saved because of his work for us and his work on us. But we work. Now, why do we work? We work because of his work. We don't work to add to his work. It is his work in us that causes our work to come out of us for him, to God, as an offer of praise. We present ourselves as living sacrifice, acceptable unto God as an act of worship. We're not working for our salvation. We're working for our Savior, whose work is what saves us. I don't know any other way to say it. I've said it as clear as I can. But people will still pervert it. And so we do not, we say no to nomianism, we say no to legalism. But there's another one. You see, Paul said no to legalism. He said no to legalism in Romans chapter 4. He put that heresy aside because in Romans 4 and Romans 5, he says this, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We not only are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we're saved for the glory of God alone. And then he says, and because it's of grace, we've got five blessings bestowed on us through what Christ has done for us. But therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have access to God. We can suffer for God. We can give glory to God in our sufferings and we are sealed by the Spirit of God. <clears throat> so he, he destroys legalism. And then he puts the cap on it. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I cannot out -sin God's grace. Well, he knows as soon as he says that, there's a whole other group of people. They've got their heresy. Oh, we're saved by Jesus' work, not our work. And by the way, when we sin, God's grace abounds. Hey, I got an idea. Then it doesn't matter what I do with God's law. It doesn't matter at all. If it's not necessary for salvation, then, you know, the, the song of the, of, of the uh, licentiousness and antinomianism. And by the way, Paul documents in Romans 3, 8, he was charged with this. They charged him with this. If you preach the gospel of grace, there's not only those who will reject it because of the arrogance of legalism, there will also be those who reject it because of the absorption with self and antinomianism. And so you're, you'll be vulnerable to the charge, but he answers it. He answers it clearly and powerfully. And that's what brings us to Romans 6. He answers it three ways. He answers it emotionally, first of all. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He pronounces an anathema. <clears throat> God forbid that we should ever do this. How can we do this? So there is an emotional response. Then Paul moves from his emotional response. Now, by the way, it is emotional. Listen, when Paul, is when Paul preaches the gospel and defends the gospel, this is an emotional thing. When he preaches the gospel, what does he say? I'm eager to preach the gospel. I'm unashamed to preach the gospel. It's an emotional thing. And when he defends the gospel, it's an emotional thing. Why? Folks, there's two things at stake 
in the gospel ministry. One, God's glory declared. Number two, man's eternity. Where are you going to spend it? No wonder he's emotional. Then he says, he then gives, his next response is instructional. He then goes to theology. He then goes to doctrine. That's what gives emotion. It's not emotion that's our foundation of the Christian life. Emotional passion comes out because we know the truth that's been taught to us about who God is and what God has done to us and for us and in us and through us. And so he begins to instruct, and he takes them back to this. Listen, when you're born, you're united to Adam. That means you got a sin record and a sin nature. When you're born again, you're united to Christ. That means you've got a new record. You've got a new, you've got a new record, and you've got a new heart. Now, here you had a sin heart and a sin record. Here you got a new heart, and you got a new record. You're united to Christ. And when Christ went to the cross, you were in him. You are in him. He is in you. Now you're united to a second Adam, he says. And when you're in Christ, Christ died for your sins. Christ died because of your sins. Christ, and notice the phrase I tried to emphasize. In fact, go back to it. I want to make sure you see it. The Christ who died for sins and the Christ who died because of our sins, go back to, um, go back to verse 2. By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore. He's given you the theology of baptism, union with Christ. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. What kind of a death? He who died for our sins because of our sins died to sins. So when he died, we died with him to sin. Now sin has not died to us, but we have died to sin in Christ if we are in Christ. And then as he is raised, then we are raised. So we have been, look at the verse 6, 5, we have been united with him in a death like his. What was his death? He died for sins, because of our sins, to our sins, and we are united with him. Look at the next verse, verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Listen, he is not saying, he is not saying that he is not saying in his instruction that we are, that we don't have a, we don't sin um, with individual practices of sin. He's not saying that sin is not present. What he is saying is, if you're in Christ, the power of sin has been broken. You're no longer enslaved to it. You're no longer to be ruled by it. And so that's what he is instructing us. And he's using the display of the gospel in the theology of baptism to tell us that the Holy Spirit is at work in our life. The reason we're passionate is because of what we know. This is what, three times he said it, we know, we know, we know. And now he says, remember your baptism. Now he moves from remember the truth of the gospel displayed in the sign and seal of the new covenant baptism that replaces the old covenant sign of circumcision because that's fulfilled in Christ. And the promises of God that you've got a new heart, you've got a new record in Christ have been secured in Christ so that you know that he died for your sin. He died because of your sin. He died to your sin and you died with him to sin so that sin no longer would reign over you now that you know that, how are you to respond? Go down to verse 11. So, you also must consider or reckon yourselves dead to sin. Now look, and alive to God. Why? In Christ Jesus. You're united to Christ. I tried to say it last two weeks ago. Remember, covenant signs and seals are naming ceremonies. When you have a covenant of marriage, 
and the sign and seal is applied, what's the next thing? The name is changed. It's not Alexander the Great. Remember the illustration I gave you? Whose daddy said to him, change your behavior, change your name? No, no. Jesus changes your name. In that baptismal ceremony, you're baptized in the name of Christ into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Your name is changed. My names of creation and providence, I'm a man, I'm an American, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm all that. They're now all modified by Jesus. I'm a Christian husband, a Christian man, a Christian American. That is now the supremacy. I am named by him. You are named by him. Do you remember that song we sang? I love it so much. John, let's sing it again. Um, uh, He has called you. By name. It's a quote from Isaiah 43. He has called you by name. You are mine. And when he called you by name, he did it by giving you his name. In the name of Christ. We are baptized into the name of of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So now our lives present to God. Not to be saved, but because he has named us. He has saved us. We are his and we belong to him and he belongs to us. And here is this glorious moment where Paul now does something he has not done. I've been telling you this, and now I'm giving it to you. What does he do now? For five chapters, he has been expounding the gospel. We call, in the verbs he's used, we call it the indicative. He is stating fact, 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 fact. And now, in Romans 6, as we arrive at verses 12 through 14, he does something he hasn't done yet. He's been giving you fact, gospel fact after gospel fact of who you are. Now he finally tells you what to do. Now come the imperatives. He doesn't give the imperatives earlier, lest we think what we do makes us who we are. It is not the way we live that makes us a Christian. Our works do not make us a Christian. Can I say this again? Our works do not make us a Christian. Our works reveal whether we are a Christian. It is Christ's work that makes us a Christian. I preach sermons that doesn't make me a Christian. I pray with people who come to Christ this week. That doesn't make me a Christian. I get the privilege to pastor people on to glory in Christ. That doesn't make me a Christian. I tithe, you tithe. We, that doesn't make us a Christian. Those things don't make us a Christian. They display the work of Christ who makes us a Christian. No, no know who you are in Christ because of Christ, then not only remember and know, consider what you are. Be what you know. Consider what you are in Christ, a sinner saved by grace. A sinner, by grace a saint. A saint, by grace still battling sin. For the glory of God, yet the victory is assured in Christ. Look at what he says. So consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You are united to Christ. Make life worship. You live it to God. 
not under the sin, but by grace you live it to God. Then he gets very particular. Let not, he says, therefore, in light of what you know, in light of what you remember and know, in light of what you consider that you are, now, now what? Now it's time to do. Here comes the imperative. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That, oh, that indwelling sin, that old man wants to get the seat and throne of preeminence in your life every single day. He wants the throne of director and master once again. And you are not greater than that old man, but your Savior is. And that's where you go to. You go to Christ. I'm in Christ. Therefore, let not sin, let not the principle of rebellion against God have the position of power and enthronement in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not, then he gets particular, do not present the members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Don't let gossip, don't let your tongue be used for gossip and slander. Do not let your hand be used for ungodliness. Your feet, let them not walk in the way of rebellion. Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Do not stand in the path of sinners. Do not sit in the seat of the scorner. Do not take the organs of communication that he's given you with mouth and lips, motiv mo mobilization that he's given you with arms, um, uh, uh, power that he's, I mean, uh, mo mobilization he's given you with your legs, uh, power that he's given you with your arms, thinking that he's given you with the brain. Don't present your mind to the world and the flesh and the devil. Don't present your hands to Satan and sin. Don't present your feet. Don't present your eyes. Don't present the members of your body. Now, and this is an insight. Our eyes, this, we're not materialists like the secular world. Your eyes, your brain, and, uh, and my brain, and my eyes, and your feet, and legs, and my feet, and legs, and my arms, and my hands, don't make a sin. They're instruments of sin. You remember when Jesus says, if your right hand offends you, that is, gives to sin, what does he say do? Don't be afraid. I'm not going to ask you to go, go and do likewise. What does he say to do? Cut it off. If your right eye offends, what do you do? Cut it, uh, plug it out, Right? He's not saying that because eyes and hands make you sin. He's telling you that your love for Christ and Him, your intentionality and intensity in dealing with sin is you're willing to part with eyes and hands to make war against sin. But here he's telling you the issue is not the hand. The issue is what's filling your heart. Do not let sin reign. You're not on the throne. I'm not to be on the throne. It's not about us. It's about him. Know who you are. Now be who you are. Now, not only remember, know. Not only consider, be, now present your body, mind, heart, mind, legs, feet, brain, everything. Present it to God. This is really interesting. Uh, two things I want you to see. Uh, number one, note that he does the negative first, do not. Then he says do. Why does he do that? Well, remember, remember 2 Timothy 3.16? All Scripture is profitable for what? Doctrine, what's the first thing? Re and profitable for doctrine, reproof, that's negative. You can't put on till you put off. We're not in neutral. We're sinners. So you got to go to the negative first. Put off. So do not. Then you're ready to do. Then you can put on the new man. The second thing I want you to see is this is worship language and this is war language. This is both worship language and it's war language. 
You present, your, your life is now presented to God. Here's my hands. Take my life. Remember the song we sing? Take my life and let it be, holy God, consecrated to thee. Take my hands. Take my feet. Take my heart. Take my resources. Take everything you've given to me. I now present it. Life for the Christian is worship. Whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And you see that language, present? That's military language. Present yourself in battalion. You present yourself clothed in the armor of God, ready to serve Him. Here you make your presentation. I'm ready to go to war against sin. I know what Christ has done. I am at peace with God, and I am at war with sin, the sin within me and the sin outside of me. Now, consider who I am in Christ and be that. Now, I'm ready to present myself in worship and for war against sin to lift up Christ. And so he's called us to that at one and the same time. Well, let me give you the takeaway. We'll close in prayer. It's not hard. I've already said it. I told you I'd said it, and now we say it again. You remember this language? Remember your baptism. Remember the gospel. Remember who you are in Christ. That's no. Now consider who you are in Christ. That's B. Now you're ready to do. So Cindy and I were married. My number came up for draft, and I said to her, I said, honey, you know, this is back during the Vietnam conflict. I said, honey, I'm going to have to go. We'd only been married two months. And I said, I'd rather, instead of get drafted, I'd rather go go and volunteer. My dad had been a Marine. I'd been to PLC uh, meetings, so I'm going to volunteer. She said, okay. So I went down to uh, uh, Pecan Avenue to uh, to the induction center, Uh, took my physical test, my regular test, and all of that test uh, to go into the Marines. I walked away, and he said, well, you'll be getting a letter, and I want you to go to Paris Island. We call that boot camp. So I went home. Actually, um, my dad and mom just lived a couple of blocks from where the induction center was. It wasn't hard. And I said, okay, dad, you were there at Paris Island. You were in the Marines. In fact, I was born while he was in the Marines. And I said, "Um, dad, um, And you tell me about Paris Island. He said, oh, yeah, I'd love to tell you about Paris Island. And I still don't remember all. In God's providence, they said I'd never got orders to report. I just got a a letter about six, seven months later that um, they weren't going to call me up until or if, until or if the Vietnam War became a declared war, which it never was. Uh, So I guess I could still get called up. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what they'd do with me now. Um, but, um, but anyway, um, so the other day, now <laughs> I said all that to say this. I was uh, looking at a YouTube trying to find another YouTube where an umpire was ejecting a manager. I love to look at those. I just think it's wonderful when an umpire ejects. I love that language, ejects a manager. And, um, and then there's one that came up. Uh, Paris Island, 1970. Well, that was the year I was supposed to go. And so I watched it through. And I'm not going to take you through the 30-minute thing that I watched, but here's what it was. They shaved you down, they stripped you down, and they went to work on you. So whatever you were, from now on, you're going to think of yourself as a Marine. That's what you are. I don't care what you looked like. I don't care what you were. I don't care what people said about you. Right here, we're Marines. Then they said, I want you to think of yourself. First, your thought is a Marine. Now I'm going to teach you what to do as a Marine for these next weeks. Now I know you're looking at this and going, here, that's Marines and that's war. Folks, we're at war. Have you not noticed recently? You're a Christian. 
you're a Christian. Consider yourself a Christian. Not by your work, but by his work for you. Now do your work for him. Let's go to war against sin. Let's go to worship in life for God. Know who you are. That's why preaching and teaching and discipleship, large group, small group, is so crucial. Yes, you can know the Word of God and not know the God of the Word. But you can't know the God of the Word and who you are because of what that God has done unless you get in to that Word and that Word gets in to us. Then reflect, be who you are in Christ. Now we're ready to do what we do with hands and feet and mouth and lips and tongue and brain and and, and, uh, arms. Now we're ready to do what we do for Christ. Can I use another illustration from two years before the Marine Corps sign up? I was at East Mecklenburg High School, and at the end of every day, our principal would get on, and he would tell us, you are an East Mecklenburger. And then he would say this, remember who you are and where you're from. Who are you? God's Word says you're a trophy of grace under God's gracious work, and his grace is at work in you, on you, and through you as you present yourself to him and to his glory. Those are the glorious things that he's given us. I'm out of time, so let me just finish it up this way. Let me try to encapsulate this for you. The inevitable, what about our works, our obedience in life? The inevitable evidence of God's saving grace is a changed life, a life that is not perfect, but presented intentionally to God and for God out of love to God. A life that is at peace with God through Jesus and a life that is at war against sin because of a love to Jesus. The evidence of God's saving grace is our works, our changed life, that we are imperfect yet workmanships of his grace. And a changed life comes from a new heart. Our life is a heart issue. A changed life comes from a new heart that is displayed in the changed life which is presented to God's praise and a war against sin. But the changed life that is displayed, that the changed heart that is displayed in a changed and changing life for God's glory through his grace is, has its point of origin in the mind. Let me say it this way. God has designed you to live for his glory, and that's why he saved you. And God has designed you to live for his glory, and that's why he has saved you, by changing your heart and changing your record. But the pathway of God's saving grace to the heart displayed in life. Let me say it again. The pathway of God's saving grace to the heart which is displayed in life. The pathway is through the mind. That's the pathway. And it's in that mind that we realize that our God who didn't need us loved us. And he sent his son to save us from our sins. He not only sent his son to save us from our sins. Now, listen to me carefully, please, again. Don't misquote me, please. I know you wouldn't do it intentionally, but just listen carefully. God saved us from our sins by saving us from himself. 
we were under his righteous judgment. God saved us from our sins by saving us from himself. And he saved us from himself by and through himself. He gave his son. That we might know we have everlasting life. That we might be his and he is ours. That we might do for the joy of giving him glory. And in the midst of the battle against sin, we keep looking up. Through the word of God, by the spirit of God. Hallelujah. What a great Savior. Father, thank you for the moments we could be in your word. Would you please take these thoughts and place them in our hearts and our souls? May I ask you just to take a moment. The Holy Spirit speak to you. Paul has instructed us, remember, no, no, no. Three times he says it. Who has saved you and his saving work? You're no longer united to Adam. You're united to Christ. The one who died for your sin, we died with him to sin. We now live with him to God. Consider, reflect. Be what you know you are because of Christ. Now, folks, join me in this prayer, please. Make it in your heart. Jesus, help us now do what we do together for Christ. Loving you with all of heart, soul, and mind and loving one another and making disciples of all the nations. We do so in worship, and we do so for your glory, and we do so by grace. In Jesus' name, amen.